If you're ready, say, I'm ready. That was pretty pathetic. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm tired of the devil getting all of our celebration and the things of the world getting all of our celebration. God is good, and God's going to do some things this morning. I just have a feeling, man. I just having a moment as worship was going on today, just trying to be sensitive to what God's doing, and I believe that God's got you here on purpose today. You know that? You're here on purpose today. He's got a word for you. And by the way, you're a really good-looking crowd, too. So you look, you look really good today. Seriously. Better than normal. I just wanted to tell you that. Acts chapter 16 is where we're going to be. I know this is Palm Sunday, but I could not figure out how to preach that this week because I wanted to get, uh, I wanted to get, you know, Dave and, and Blake to be waving palm leaves while Pastor Brian rode in on a donkey, but it just didn't work out this week at all. Y'all would have loved to seen that, wouldn't you? Yeah, Miss Donna wants to see that, and what Miss Donna wants, Miss Donna gets. <laughs> Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Pay attention to that part. The other prisoners were listening. And suddenly there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations, and all the doors immediately flew open, and the chains, check it out. The Bible's so cool. The chains of every prisoner fell off of every prisoner fell off. And then the jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop. Don't kill yourself. We are all here. Today, I want to talk to you about on the subject of the chain reaction. And if you came to have church today, will you say amen while you clap your hands one more time? See God do some things today. See what he's speaking. See what he's speaking to us. A chain reaction usually is a series of events that leads to other events. And I just want to real quickly touch on the idea that God does not waste moments. We waste moments, we think, but God doesn't waste moments. There was a series of events that got us to this place right here, right now, for such a time is this, and this is how ridiculously foolish I can be. I believe God has brought us here for this moment because there's someone in the room who needs a life change. I believe that. Four people believe that. I believe that. Because if you go back through this whole story, when Paul and Silas tried to go to the province of Asia, Asia and the Holy Spirit stopped them, and then they tried to go to another province, and the Holy Spirit stopped them, and then they ended up in Philippi, and then they met Lydia, and Lydia and her whole household came to know the Lord, and then they're walking to the place of prayer again, and then Paul and Silas start getting tormented by this demon girl, and Paul cast out the demon, and they end up inside this prison in a very difficult circumstance, but at the end of the story, you see that a jailer needed to know the Lord. Lord. God does not waste moments. God works all things together for our good. All things. The pain and the pleasure, the grace and the grind, the mess, the mundane, the miraculous, the mountaintops and the valleys. God works all things together for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So I want you to see what Paul and Silas's reaction response was in the middle of this moment. And we're going to encounter a couple of characters in this story who actually existed. And I feel like you probably have more in common with the one that you don't think you have something in common with. When we'll get to that here at the end. But we're flash forwarding. We'll deal with Jesus's resurrection next week during resurrection Sunday. But I felt like this is what God put on my heart. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I, Blake and I have been talking, and I just have a feeling that God is about to break loose here on 3rd Street. Maybe it's just me. 
Maybe I've, just, I, maybe I've just got my foolish faith back. I don't know, but I believe that God has placed you here for such a time as this. No matter what's going on in Metropolis, Illinois, God's got his people ready to reach them. I believe in revival, but I believe that we wait around on a move of God way too much when we are the move of God. God wants us to get going and teaching and preaching. So Paul and Silas, they're on this journey. And we'll, we'll pick up this moment right before they, they wind up in prison. And this fortune teller girl, she was a servant of, of her masters. They said that she had a spirit that could, that could see the future. So she's like, Miss Cleo's assistant is following Paul and Silas around. And this is what she's saying. These are servants of the Most High God telling people how to be saved. She wasn't incorrect in what she was saying but she didn't have the right spirit. The devil wants to flatter you too. Do you know that, right? Paul, recognizing that he did not need a demonic recommendation, eventually got annoyed by this girl following them around, and he turned around and said, come out of her in the name of Jesus, and immediately she was in her right mind. And I would just say that some of you need to have that kind of faith if something's following you around like that, to turn around and say, in the name of Jesus, get away from me. I'm resisting you, devil, and watch him flee. But see... The, the fortune tellers recognized because this woman was in her right mind that they just lost their money maker. And they're like, mad about it. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and they drugged them in front of the magistrates and they stirred up the whole city and everybody was against them. They said, they're wreaking havoc in our town. And so the magistrates ordered Paul and Silas to be thrown into prison. And they also ordered that they be beaten and they be flogged. Paul did something right, and this was the result of it. Isn't that interesting? Beaten and flogged, and then they put a jailer in charge of them, and he put them into the inner dungeon, into stocks. And when you study on how they would have been in that inner prison, the jailer would have put them in some stocks that would have made them in an uncomfortable situation. In the darkness, uncomfortable, beaten, flogged, everybody against them. They're in prison. They're in chains. They're on lockdown. Now, I want to say this before I move on, is there's probably none of us in the room that, have gone, that are going through what Paul and Silas just went through, correct? Anybody been beaten and flogged on the way to work? Now, your wife probably just hit you with the newspaper because you wouldn't shut up. You haven't been beaten or flogged, okay? Nobody's probably going through what they're going through, but I think we can learn something by how they reacted. I want to teach you a new response song. Because it says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were in prison. Now remember, they're uncomfortable, it's dark, they're in chains, they've been beaten, can't see, they're being guarded by a jailer. It all seems hopeless, okay? Okay. But it says around midnight, I want to teach you about the response. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were doing something. They were praying. This is amazing to me. And maybe this is why some of us can't come in and worship. Because we don't have the right response song when we're going through things. Because it's easy to worship God when things are going well. I get the promotion, God is good. She said yes, God is good. Yes, right. Things are going well. My kids get good grades. I get a vacation. God is good. Salvation's happening. We're baptizing every week. God is good. But what is your response song when you're in the darkest moments of your life? It says around midnight, if you want to put that scripture up there, Paul and Silas were, were, were singing, or were praying and singing hymns Hymns to God. Paul and Silas, I just I want you to I want you to picture this moment. I'm not gonna make myself uncomfortable. Do you wanna be you wanna be Silas today? Come be Silas with me. Come sit down. Paul and Silas are in the inner dungeon. I'm doing the scoot right now. <laughs> Scooting away from you. <laughs> Paul and Silas are in the inner dungeon. Just been beaten, just been flogged. I don't know what kind of moment you're going through. 
But I know if I was going through what Paul and Silas were going through, and when I go through difficult times, because I just came out of a very, very difficult time, and my response song was not to pray and sing hymns to God. See, most of our response songs are complaining songs, right? Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Man of constant sorrow, life stinks, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I'm going to eat some worms. I never understood that song at all. But that's most of our response songs is whine, complain, give up, God doesn't love me, God's not good, God's not faithful, I'm going to come to church, but I sure am not going to worship. I know that I need to pray, but why should I pray to a God who's allowed me into a situation like this with my buddy, especially when we did something right? Now, whether your situation was self-inflicted because we are dumb enough to get ourselves in our own prisons, correct? I figure you'd say amen to that because I'm a dumb person at times. Amen? amen? Okay, we're all dumb enough to do that, but sometimes things just happen. Persecution comes, and these are the results of it. But Paul, Paul and Silas had a different response song. And I want us to develop a different response song, especially as we're going into Easter. Because as with any week, I suspect that many of you are still locked in some sort of prison. Chains have still got you. And I would say the prison of your mind is the worst prison of all. Some of you can't get out of it. And our response song is complain and worry and anxiety and complain and worry and anxiety and anger and hurt and complain and worry. And that's what we're singing. We're walking around and singing. And then you find those songs of angst and you really just relate to those. But Paul and Silas were singing something that when you study this, it's called the Great Hallel. The Great Hallel. And it was Psalms 118 through Psalms 136. Okay, so I was like, I'm going to go read those psalms because there's some psalms that are called imprecatory psalms in the Bible. And what an imprecatory psalm is, is, is basically David saying, God crush my enemies. Destroy them. Fire come from your eyes, God. Show them who's boss. We don't write a lot of worship songs like that, but we will do one next week so y'all can lift your hands like, God crush my enemies. Let fire. Somebody said Amen. But I went and read Psalms 118, and do you know what the first verse is in Psalms 118? Remember, beaten, flogged, thrown into the darkest part of the dungeon like they were the worst criminals. They're uncomfortable in their situation. Do you know what Psalms 118.1 says? It's a blow your mind. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his steadfast love endures forever. His steadfast... You know what Paul and Silas recognized? Check this out. You know what they recognized? They can imprison my body, but they cannot imprison my spirit. And we have to get a response song, a reaction of when we're going through stuff that God, I don't understand, but I'm going to give thanks to the Lord because he is good, that his faithful love endures forever, that this is but a moment and he is faithful enough to be with me through it. See, what we want to get a response song for is to get us to quit focus, focusing on what's being done to us and start focusing on who's with us. Amen. Who is with us? So I just want you to, maybe, maybe we need to get a little response song today. What do you think? A little, a little two-part harmony like we're a 90s band here. Okay. Just, yeah, just get it. We'll get it. And Paul and Silas, like they're in, they're in the dungeon and it's dark and all hope is lost. And this is where some of you are because all hope's been lost. You're devastated. You feel like you're never going to get out of this. The storm's never going to stop. I'm never going to change. Recognize we're not going through what Paul and Silas is going through, but if they can respond like this in this situation, what excuse do we got? Amen? 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 So imagine in the darkest moment, and I'm not going to sing the great Hillel because I can't sing Hebrew, okay? 
But imagine in that moment, like it was some of us, we'd, Paul and Silas are there and they're praying to God and then all of a sudden they just start busting out. What can wash away my sin? Sing it. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Very good, Silas. That was pretty. That was... That was that was that was pretty. It's pretty. We get we get Blake up here, man. We could be in sync like doing this song right now. Backstreets back, all right, breaking those chains. But hey, I want you I want you to join. Just imagine whatever you're going through right now. These individuals this morning gave you an opportunity to worship God, who is above your circumstances who's above your problems, who's greater, his grace is greater than all of your sins, and the enemy wants nothing more than to silence you. But man, you'll confuse the enemy if you're in those moments. Can you worship with us if you're like, what can wash away my sin? Sing it. This goes, what can make me whole again? Sing it. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know it. Can you worship him now? And oh, precious is the flow. Come on. That makes me white as snow. No other founts I know. Nothing but the blood Now, if Jesus has changed your life, just put your hands up. Oh, precious is the blood Come on. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Do you see how that lifts your perspective? When you remember what God has done, you see, Paul probably remembered he was on the road to Damascus and he encountered Jesus in that moment. And Jesus, he's seen Jesus do some things in his life. Do you remember that moment that he saved you? The same God who saved you is the same God who's with you in that moment. He is faithful. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And the enemy wants you to focus on your chains, but we need to focus on our God. That's what the enemy wants us to do, and I've heard it said one time, either your praise will break your chains or your chains are going to break your praise. And we have way too many believers right here in the western part of the world that have let our chains break our praise. We are no different than the rest of the world. Captain, outrage culture, everything, everybody's anxious, everybody's worried, everybody's upset, nobody's different. But what would happen if there's a group of believers that would walk in and be a little bit different, that would actually use their chains to preach the gospel, that would praise their God? Because check out, go back to the verse, check this out. Check this out. Check this out. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What's that say? The other prisoners were. They were listening. So this is like midnight. How many of you like to get to bed early? How many of you like noise after you've gone to bed? You, Jesse, you like noise after you've gone to bed? Oh, okay. <laughs> So ima imagine, these guys are in the innermost part of the dungeon, like people are sleeping like, shut up! Or maybe they're perplexed. But you know what the question I have is? I wondered if that prison had ever heard praise before. <laughs> I wonder if the prison that you're in right now has ever heard you praise. I wonder if it's ever, ever heard you give glory to God. Oh, but I'm waiting on God to do a miracle. How many of you like miracles? Everybody like miracles? Everybody believe he's a God of miracles? But you can't have a miracle unless you first have a mess. <laughs> and if you don't learn to praise God in the mess, sometimes you're going to miss out on your miracle. That's a lot of M's right there. But Paul and Silas, they were praising God in the, the prison, was hearing the praise. And this is what I want you to, I want you to determine this in your heart. This is going to be my response on, this is going to be my reaction to my chains. It's not going to, it's not going to break my praise. 
But I'm going to praise God. And listen, Paul and Silas weren't praising God because they knew God could change their circumstances. They were praising God because he's worthy. I don't praise God for what he can give me. I praise God because he's worthy. I'm thankful that he's a good father and I reap his benefits. But if he didn't change my situation, he's still a good God and worthy of all of my praise. He's worthy of my singing. He's worthy of me going and preaching. He's worthy of me spending time with him. If he never gave me another thing, he gave me Jesus, which was absolutely enough and all I needed. And that's enough right there to start singing in the midst of my darkest moments. That's my response song. And then it says, suddenly, suddenly there was a massive earthquake. That's some hardcore praising. I would say that Eastland probably doesn't want to lose this building, but I mean, if God does it, God does it, you know. But suddenly, suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. And all the doors flew open. And the chains of Every prisoner fell off. Every prisoner. There's power in your praise. There's inspiration in your praise. Do you know people come in this morning and they're struggling and they're hurting and they're confused? And there's a whole litany of things that we could list, but you know your situation. But what do you do when you see a man that got laid off getting up here and worshiping God. What does that do for you? I've watched Cheryl Nix stare down cancer I don't know how many times, but you know what's consistent about her? She praises God whether he heals her or he doesn't. She's still going to give him the glory, and that inspires me. That sets other people free to see people like that. When you've been set free by God, you can't help but praise him. You'll use those broken chains to tell other people he can break your chains as well. We need to have that kind of response song as a church. Church. I've watched it, Cheryl, and I think, man, I hope I have that mentality if I have to stare down something like that. I watched BJ and Jesse and Blake and Carissa when, with their children have to have open heart surgery, and I've watched them praise God. They was, it was, it was nerve-wracking. It was difficult. Nobody's saying it's not. Nobody's saying that you're not going to have moments of worry, but sometimes you just have to pour out your praise to God because he is in control. See, the jailer thought that he was in control of them. No. God can send an earthquake to set them free. God can do anything to set you free, but it starts with your response song. You're sitting around complaining, waiting on God to do something. How about you just start worshiping God for who he is? I guarantee you, you're going to see him do something. And it may not be a change of your circumstances, but it will be a change of your perspective. Let's give Silas a hand here. That was their response song. And so many of us that are in chains, we think we have the strength to get ourselves out of it. But that's... I think that's the picture of the gospel period is we don't have the strength, but we sing to our strength. In Psalms, it says he is my strength and my song. He's the lifter of my head. I don't come out of moments like I've been through and like you've been through because I can muster up enough of my own strength to get out of it. It's God who lifted me out of the pit. He reached down when I quit looking at the pit and started looking out of the pit to the God who is able, the God who is faithful. When I lifted my eyes to the hills and recognized where my help comes from, that's when he reached down and he pulled me out of the pit and he set my feet upon a solid rock and he steadied me as I walked. It's our response song. That's when things changed because the more I complained, the worse it got. The more I complained, the more I felt the enemy coming in. But when I started praising, the enemy backs off. He gets confused by it. He starts fighting himself. And then God eventually brought me out of it. And I don't know the purpose for why I went through what I went through, but I know God doesn't waste a moment. I know he brought me to the other side right here because there's somebody that needs the Lord, that he was doing something in me. And for that, I give him all the glory. God is wanting to release something from you. What is your response song? 
Here's the crazy part about this. So there's an earthquake. Prison shaken to its foundations. The doors immediately flew open. The chain of every prisoner fell off. If it's me, I've been in prison. I've been beaten. I've been flogged. I've been in this uncomfortable situation. God loosens everything, shakes it loose, opens the door, drops my chains, door open. What are you doing? I'm out. I, I would even walk all confident too, like, I don't even know if that looked confident or not. I don't know. <laughs> but I'd be out. I'm gone. I'm not staying. But guess what happened here? No one left. <laughs> Run, dummy, you know? Yeah. No one left. Because Paul and Silas recognized they had a responsibility. See, the enemy persecuted them. But God took the enemy's persecution and turned it to a position for them. Watch this. They had a responsibility because there was a jailer that was in the prison. Have you ever really considered that God's taken you through your moments and set you free from them because there's a jailer? They didn't leave the prison because there was a jailer that needed the Lord. They didn't run. They didn't bolt. Their circumstances said slip out, but their love and their commitment to the commission of the gospel of Jesus Christ said stay because there was a jailer right there in the prison. And I started thinking about this. And I remembered something that Jesus said in Luke chapter 4. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free. I think maybe sometimes we forget where ministry is done. God's given all of us a responsibility, right? Great commission. You agree with that? Say amen. To go into all the world and to preach the gospel, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God's always given you opportunities as you go to minister. We've got a responsibility. And he didn't say, when everything's going good, that's when you do the ministry. Actually, if you just go with what Jesus just said, I remembered something, is that ministry is done in the prison. Because that's where people aren't free. Ministry's done in the mess. Freedom is found in the prison. And it just may be possible that you went through your chains because God wanted to release something from you through you for somebody else. You can use those chains to testify to someone else. You've got a responsibility. As a matter of fact, you need to tell the devil, you put me in this prison this prison has become my pulpit. I'm here to preach. I'm here to reach. You read about Paul all throughout his letters. <laughs> There's a time he was chained to a Roman guard. Actually, that Roman guard was chained to him because you know Paul was giving him the gospel all the time. You think you got me. Actually, I got you and I got your full attention. Your prison has become your pulpit. So many of us are like, all right, God set me free. I'm gone. I'm done. I'm over. It's good. Cool, man. I'm going back to my life. And then we find ourselves back in the same kind of situations over and over again. But what is God wanting to do in the prison? What's the responsibility while you're there? There was a jailer that needed the Lord. It's our responsibility. Well, I'm not responsible for other people. Yes, you've been given the gospel, which is the good news, and people need it. Well, God can't use me with what I've been through. I would say you're more effective because of what you've been through. Hey, come on now. Some of you are like, well, I've been divorced. Hey, and I don't feel like God can ever use me again. Come on now. 
You can be more effective than you've ever had before if you've submitted yourself to God. But what about the things that I did in my past? Okay, you've overcome drugs. God sets you free. Can't you tell other drug addicts how to get out of that lifestyle because you encountered a chain breaker? You are more effective when you go through things. You've got to recognize where the ministry happens. And every week, right here, all over this county, people are in prison. And if we get there through circumstances out of our control and going through things and persecution or self-inflicted or however we get there, if God sets us free, we have a responsibility to tell other people who aren't free how to be free. If he's broke your chains, wouldn't you want to see somebody else's chains broke? God has placed us here for a reason. We're right here in the prison doing ministry. We have a responsibility, a responsibility. And you know, when I looked at this, I thought, who was really in the prison? Paul and Silas or the jailer? See, I think maybe you have more in common with the jailer than you do Paul and Silas. Because the jailer was the one that was put in charge. He thought he was in charge. Like so many of us think. We think we're in charge of everything. We're in control. Our pride gets in the way. We'll hold it all together. But there's a reality that needs to set in for a lot of us. That's my next R. Three R's like a good Southern Baptist how I grew up. R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. (laughs) There's a reality that the jailer was facing and isn't it's amazing to me how Paul and Silas had this reaction, response in the middle of all this mess. And God used them to reach a man and his family. Because this man had a very real reality. And I think this is where a lot of a lot of you are at. And here's the jailer's reaction. Let's look at the verse here. It said, The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. I don't know how he didn't wake up through the earthquake. He must have been some kind of heavy sleeper or something. He woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. This is what he's been put in charge of. Keep the prisoners in the jail. Make sure everything goes smoothly. You have the keys. Don't let them escape. The problem is, is you're not God. God has the power to shake things loose. So the jailer woke up and everything that he thought he had control over was shaken loose, broke loose, doors open. And he had been asleep the whole time. And let me tell you why he drew his sword to kill himself. Because under the Roman law there, if a jailer allowed a prisoner to escape, he himself would receive the penalty that the prisoner had that that, that escaped. So the penalty would be put on the jailer's head, and he would have to live that out and probably been death. So this is not just one prisoner that escaped. This is a bunch of them. So he was in line to receive that penalty. Now I'm going to try to make this a little bit bigger. The wages of sin is death. That's the penalty of sin. And see, when it comes to salvation, when I came to know the Lord, it said, I basically said, I am not God. I am not the Lord. Jesus is Lord of my life. I'm not in control. He's in control. I submitted myself to him. I believed on him. I believed that he rose from the dead. He changed my life. And just like the jailer, so many of us are in line to receive a penalty that we all deserve. Because, I mean, how is he going to argue with this? Well, you don't understand. God sent an earthquake. And and the doors open. Weren't you sleeping? Well, I was asleep, but God sent an earthquake. No, he'd still be in line to receive that same penalty, just like so many of us are going to find ourselves at the end of our life going, but you don't understand, God. I, 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 I tried to be a good person. I tried to do my best. See, I think there's a lot of us that maybe don't recognize 
that our situations are falling apart because we think we're good at controlling that. But I think a lot of you do recognize that your situations are crumbling and falling apart. The problem is our pride gets in the way of us being self-aware and honest and doing something about it. And then we end up like this jailer at some point in our life. He drew his sword to kill himself. This was his reality. I might as well end it. And I don't know how you came in today. I don't know if everything in your life is shaken loose, is falling apart. I don't know if you feel defeated. I don't know if you feel like you can't take it anymore. But I know there's a lot of people that feel like giving up, just like this jailer. You're thinking, what's the point? Now, maybe you won't go as far to take your own life, but mentally you've checked out. And it's just kind of a reaction that you came to church today. That's what you think. I mean, I'm just doing my thing. But what if God woke you up this morning because he wanted to tell you there's hope? And today is the day of freedom. Amen? Today's the day of freedom. Listen, I'm up here today, a man whose chains have been broken. I never thought over the past couple years I'd be standing right here again. But you know what? The devil can inflict me with his chains, but I'm going to use those chains to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because I'm a free man. You know why? Because there's a jailer. I'm not running off. I'm here. I'm right, I'm right here in Metropolis. You know why? Because there's a jailer. And there's a mother that's hurting. And there's a child that's on drugs. And there's a young girl that's been abused. And there's a, there's a family that's falling apart. There are people that are on the verge of giving up. There's people whose depression's hitting them so hard, they're literally thinking about taking their life. And we, people that have been set free, have seen God shake loose our chains, how good God is. We've got to recognize our responsibility because of the reality of another and use those chains to say, hey, don't give up. See, I think that that's where most people are at. They're at the point of giving up. They're at the point of giving in. They're done. It's over. And God's speaking to you today. And he brought you here today. And he's asking you to respond today. Because I want to show you something. You ready to watch something? Okay. So the jailer drew his sword to kill himself. Don't put that next verse up yet. I want to show you something. Can I borrow you, Blake? Chris? Dave? Jace? Just stand, stand across here. I want to show you something. Okay, when the prison was broken loose, did anybody leave? But were they free people? Everybody talk. Were they free? Okay, so you're, you're tracking with me. I want you to watch this, okay? Watch this. This is really cool. And this is what, this needs to be the mantra for Eastland Life Church. This is, this is what we need to be known as. Because a lot of you are at the point of giving up. You're about to fall on your sword. You're about to give up on your family. You're about to walk out on your family. You're about to walk out on the calling that God's put on your life because everything's broke loose because you couldn't take your hands off of it. You thought, if I have my hands on it, I could be in control of it some, but then it all broke loose. And that's where a lot of us are at today. God is speaking to you. And this is what I want you to know. Has God broke some chains in your life? It's changed your life? He's changed your life too. Are you an open prison door, been set free by Jesus? Are you an open prison door that's been set free by Jesus? Are you an open prison door that's been set free by Jesus? See, the jailer assumed the prisoners had escaped. That's important because there's a lot of us in the room that think that we're all alone. We think no one's here, Jimmy. No one understands what I'm going through. No one knows what it feels like like you ever felt insecure before you ever felt insecure you've been through some mess growing up you know what that's like what about you Dave you straight up didn't believe in God you, you know what it's like to have some issues with your dad right how many of you have been through some difficult stuff in this room before huh anybody know what pain is like come on lift your hands up you know what pain is like does anybody know what it's like to feel like giving up anybody ever come from a broken home Hey, I'm, we're, not, we're not bragging about it. We're making a point here this morning. The jailer thought 
he was alone. And you're thinking in your mind, nobody understands. But this is how God doesn't waste a moment. God will put some people through some stuff so that you can be set free. Woo! That's good. He will take some people through some stuff, get them to the other side so they can come in and speak and go, you still can have hope. You still can make it. God still does love you. I know you feel like you're nothing more than an addict right now, but God can set you free. I was an addict, and I can tell you about freedom. People do understand. Watch this now. He he drew his sword to kill himself. He thought nobody was there. Check it out. Paul shouted to him. Put that verse up. Stop. Don't kill yourself. We are all, we're all here. Nobody's gone. Nobody's left you. You are not alone. We, right here, are all here. I asked anybody if God's brought them through some stuff in this room. Can you lift your hands and say, we are all right here. You are not alone. Nobody's going to think you're crazy. Don't give up. Don't give in. We are all here. We're here. We're here. You don't have to throw in the towel. You don't have to fall on your sword. We are all right here, and every one of us have been through something different. But God sets those kinds of people free so they can point you to the freedom that they encountered. We are all here.